Welcome to the Where Chats podcast, a series where we dive into the conversations surrounding all facets of e-commerce and people working to make it a more sustainable and productive industry for all. My name is Greg Moore, the founding CEO of Where, and your host for today's podcast. Today, I talked to Juan Lopez Salaberry about how he went from venture capital to working for a mentorship nonprofit to founding a sports apparel brand. His advice for founders to start with a concept and to not be afraid to put it out there to test customer intent and why radical honesty breeds customer loyalty. Hey there, and welcome to the Wear Chats podcast. Uh, today, I have Juan Lopez Salaberry with me. And Juan is the founding CEO of Interforce, uh, a top quality apparel uh, and gear brand for amateurs and athletes. So welcome to the podcast, Juan. Thank you, Greg. It's good to be here. Awesome. And you're in Spain, is that correct? Yeah, I'm currently in Mallorca, Spain. Awesome. It sounds amazing. What's one of your favorite things about Mallorca versus other places you've lived? I think there's a beautiful combination of being small enough and big enough. Weather is fantastic. The airport here in Mallorca is one of the most connected airports of the whole of Europe, which also gives you, sort of never leaves you on that island sensation of, I'm trapped. Uh, it's very easy to get in and out. And the, the beauty of the nature here is just out of this planet. It's, it's a fantastic place to train. All year round, athletes come uh, from all over the world to cycle, to run, to um, you know, sail, uh, there's an amazing sort of setup along one of the coasts where there's pure mountain and then right off the mountain, the ocean, uh, which also makes it spectacular. Oh, that's amazing. I, I did a lot of time um, when I did, I did a couple triathlons. The, the longest distance was a half Ironman. Um, and I lived in um, the San Mateo region at the time in California, right? So we'd go over to Santa Cruz and then train throughout the hills between the Bay Area and um, in Santa Cruz, then it sounds a lot like that, only probably a little bit colder here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it I sounds agree. amazing. I mean, just it sounds absolutely gorgeous. So very cool. Yeah. Well, one one of the ways that I like to get started um, with the podcast is a, a little bit about your background, and maybe not so much about the business background, but your personal background, right? Um, so in that sense. Is there a motto that has stuck with you um, that, that maybe your parents or your friends or somewhere in life you picked up that's really stuck with you that you've kind of built your life around uh, and kind of made you the person that you are today? So I think there's there's a lot of things that are changing, right? I think one of the one of the most interesting elements that currently resonate with me has a lot to do with the fact that everything is constant change. Um, and so there's... And I'm afraid to say that a lot of the things that sort of were ingrained in my childhood or sort of in my brain there have also been changing a lot. Uh, and it, and it's, I'm actually made very good friends with that concept of, of this being challenged constantly and sort of having a sense of constantly sort of looking for upgrades in things we do. Because a lot of times what really happens is that a lot of our reality gets shaped by the stories we tell ourselves. And that narrative of that sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that we start building up ends up being very true because that's how we perceive ourselves. And we perceive others through that same lens, right? So if uh, you know, if we remain somehow attached to those things that happened um, when we were kids, we would all be like, <laughs> basically just submitting check after check to that therapist trying to say let's go back to and see what's happening because you know the, the one thing that we all have in common is sort of pain you know we come from pain and we're dealing with pain and we're just trying to solve it. you know that's kind of our thing with entrepreneurs you know we're just trying to solve a pain point <laughs> you know but it's very it's very much ingrained with how we work as human beings you know we have pain we have things that are there and so I think probably trying to sort of go back to your question and not completely hack it <laughs> to go anywhere else, I think probably one of the most interesting parts about my childhood had to do with understanding the power of perception. And so how much of what we live is really that story that we tell ourselves. And that story changes. So having been very aware of that and constantly sort of coming back to that question, I think has been probably the most important thing in my life across mm. 
uh, this almost 40 years I've been on this. <laughs> That's awesome. I, it's so funny. I mean, how many times have you heard the concept, you know, if, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. Or, and then on the flip side of that is people defending that stance saying, you know, this is the way we've always done it. Oh, and oh, it's oh, funny. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's the worst, right? You hear that, and you're like, oh, like everything inside of you just sinks, and you're like, oh no, don't be that person. And it's it's kind of funny because as as entrepreneurs, one of the first things that kind of makes you successful is this drive to challenge the norm. <clears throat> if there was nobody challenging the norm, there would be no entrepreneurship. You know what I mean? And so inherently, you know that what you just said is accepting and sort of. Uh, uh, I don't know, like, like uh, giving yourself the, the grace to, to, to change your ideas, to change your beliefs um, is what entrepreneurship is in the sense, right? It's just focused around a problem that other people have, but um, really cool. I love that concept. I love There's that concept. also, you know, you would, you would just tell me it resonates a lot with something that I, I'm constantly battling with here in Spain, which is this very common sort of go back to expression of el de toda la vida. You know, like the one that we've sort of like, you know, oh, this is a great product in the toda la vida. The one like, you know, we've had for the whole, like all from our whole existence, like since forever, this has been it, right? Like, oh, we don't want this thing because it's new. We want el de toda la vida. We want the one that we've always had. <laughs> but I mean, in a way it's like, you know, like trying to, you know, eat us a soup with a, with a fork saying, but no, this is the way we've always done it. Like, why do you want that other thing? You know, what's that? A spoon? Why? <laughs> what was that with this fork? It's like, okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. When you're still eating it, but I'll be done in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. No, it's a great, it's a great framework to live by. It's funny. It reminds me. So, um, you know, one of the frameworks that I grew up with or, or models that I grew up with by, my, my parents were very big into this concept of return home with honor, right? And so the whole thing, my, my dad, I swear to you, he put on our door as we were leaving the house, this placard that said return home with honor, right? And it was in other areas of the house. And the whole concept there was like, don't do anything in the world that you wouldn't feel comfortable doing in front of us. Um, and when you come back home, make sure that you bring the honor that we've given you out into the world with you. Um, that is and it was really yeah, it was just really, it was like, it's funny because on the one hand, there's a lot of pressure, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's tough to, to make mistakes under that guise. But on the other hand, if you can understand that it's like guide rails, not a specific like track, um, then it kind of keeps you within those guide rails. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to mess up a little bit, but I needed to, I need to, to make sure that I'm like, taking my family name with me. And there's also so an there's a weird one. I think there's also an element of of coming in terms coming coming to peace with the fact that we're not perfect. Yeah. And we'll never be. You know? But that doesn't mean you cannot strive to do better. Sure. Um, but but you, you know, you'll have your your you know, your moments that you're not gonna feel extremely proud. And you'll definitely come back one day saying, you know, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. But it wasn't the day. <laughs> but but those are the learnings, you know, those are the good right. moments. I think there's one framework or that one sort of mantra that I've sort of now is very much in my head these days, which is be prepared for greatness. Mm. You know, do, do, do the work to come out on the other side with some awesome performance, something that you're proud of, you know, something that, yeah. you, you know, and, and I mean this in the most, you know, wider sense of, 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 the, of the concept, right? Like either how you, you know, how you treat people, how you communicate, how you perform in your company, how you perform with your friends, how you just just come up, you know, can you, you know, show up to life, right? And so I think a lot of it has has a lot to do with preparing yourself and doing like groundwork and seeing, you know, and, and I think a lot of that also comes with the questions, not the answers, because we don't, we don't really know. The more questions you ask, the less you know. But, but if you sort of keep on asking yourself the questions and you're constantly checking in and that level of self-awareness, just will will just keep on uh, you know helping you and striving to sort of put you in that place. Yeah, I, I love that concept. I think um, <clears throat> a lot of times, like I, I coach uh, a youth soccer team, and it's really interesting. It's it's competitive, so they travel all over California to play. And um, watching the kids warm up when they're looking at the other team, 
and the variation of their psychologies with that. Like some kids like, Oh, those guys look tough. Yeah. yeah coach, you think we're going to win this one? You know? And some kids like Psh, wiping the floor. It doesn't even matter. Like whoever it is, don't care. Um, but they all work the same way in practice, right? They just, they put it in every single day. And it's really interesting when that whole notion of prepare for greatness, right? Is, is when they get to the point where they can use their training, they have to train their psychology as well to get over any fears that they have that are trying to prevent them from getting to greatness. And so I think like, that's a big piece of, of what we try to teach is to, to not just keep your body strong, not just to understand, you know, the players, the momentum of the game or what to do or be technically sound, but mentally we have to be able to check in as well. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool concept. And a lot of it is, and it's, and it's funny because we'll, we'll talk about this, I guess, in a minute when we talk about what you guys do and, and how it's, it's sort of a great solution to unlock uh, a bit of the potential. But there's a great formula that comes from coaching, which is performance is equal to potential minus interference. And a lot of the times what is interference or the main element within interference is fear. So if you are a leader of some sort, what you really want to focus on is how can I work on that element of potential and reduce that element of interference in whoever you're leading. So there's literally a lot to be said, especially when it comes to kids. Yeah, I got to write uh, that down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's literally a lot to be said, with, especially with kids, about how you're really building that element of self-esteem. Yeah. You're showing them that you believe in them even before they do. And you also address very clearly and very much, you know, for its face value, what they're afraid of. When you're, when you're a kid, you're like, you know, you're thinking there's a monster in the closet. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, what else can you do as a father? Just go open the closet and say, you know what? Let's shut up. Like, let's, let's put the light in here. There's nothing. Yeah. All this thing that's haunting you, it's nothing. It's your mind telling you there's a monster, but the monster is not right. there. <laughs> So, and, and that happens every time, right? Like when you guys have, you know, you build a product to sort of, in a way, reduce the friction of someone not knowing what the size they're going to wear. It's literally, what, what are we addressing? It's the fear of me ordering something. And then when it comes, not fitting. Yeah. So how are we going to sell more? How are we going to increase that performance? Well, we're going to reduce the friction. We're going to reduce interference. We're going to reduce the fear factor. I love that concept. It's so, it's so crisp. You know, it's like the fear of sizing is, is, is just like the fear of anything else, but it is the thing in many cases yeah. that stops you from taking action. Yeah. It's a really interesting concept. Well, one with that, let's, let's go ahead and pivot. Let's, um, so one, thank you. I just, I love having sort of like organic psychological, emotional conversations. It's my mom and me and it's been there forever and I could probably dig on that for hours. <clears throat> but, um, that being said, I'd love to just learn a bit more about your background right? You know, how, how did you get to where you are? How did you get to start in a force? Um, and what were sort of the things from your background that, that got you to that point? Don't worry. We're just not going to leave this very soft terrain because that's also where I live. <laughs> uh, so even if we're going to switch topics, it's still going to come. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to relentlessly pursue opening my heart to uh, what's, what's, what's about to come. So uh, my background is, I think I've been in entrepreneurship for, for most of my professional life in one way or the other. Um, I've gone through um, enough of my parents' money uh, trying to build something. Uh, I've gone through problems with co-founders and, and raised money and, 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 and I had to you know, go back to the investors and say, you know what, things didn't really work out. You know, your, your money is kind of gone. Um, I've, you know, gone to big companies uh, in the name of a company that never existed to sign a big contract with like this huge multinationals and like last minute saying, do you mind if I just like put my own name in here? Because we don't really have a company. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've been through all sides and then eventually I moved on to venture capital. And um, I was running an accelerator for startups out of outside of Mexico, you know, out of Mexico City. Uh, we we're mainly the 500 startups branch for uh, Spanish-speaking markets. They're still there; they're doing a great job. Um, but sort of my time after a few years of, of going through different batches and 
being involved in, I think, pretty much about 100 investments. Um, I moved out of Mexico to Miami and uh, moved on and started doing a lot of things, including a lot of sport. And then I... One, real quick, what was your what was your driver to leave the VC space? So it's, there's this, oh, I don't know how to call it. Like there's a psychological holy grail approach that says like, you know, if I'm a startup founder and I'm successful and then I join a VC fund, then I'm like, I really hit it. I've really made it, right? And, and, and you kind of went the opposite way. Yeah. Um, so I know there's a, there's a lot between sort of like sitting on, on the back end and enabling versus being an operator. And those are two very, very different skill sets. So I'm sure you probably wanted to invest in that. Um, but I'd love to hear from your perspective, like why you made that transition when you made it. We go back to the heart. <laughs> <laughs> it got to a point that I was sort of burned out and I didn't quite enjoy it as much. Um, there were many things. I actually wrote a, a piece that I'm, I'm looking to at some point bring out to the world. Uh, but I, I think a lot of it has to do with being in the middle of needs, right? When you're a venture capital, you got on one side founders pulling you from, from one end saying, we need money, we need money. And look at this, we've built the next multi-billion dollar company. And then you ask yeah. the question of like, so what, what, what have you done so far? Well, we have this great idea, right? <laughs> but it's going to be the biggest thing on the planet. Right. Right? And you have like this thing. Uh, and on the other side, you have a constant need to fundraise. And sort of you sort of also need something. So there's need here, there's need here. And I kind of do have a big sense of, um, like I love having very genuine relationships. And usually when you want to connect from heart to heart and you want to sort of really be able to be in peace with who you are and what you can give and what you can receive, it's very hard to do it when there's a need and there's a very strong need. Things, communication and, and, and everything just becomes biased and it goes to a very transactional element of why we're even talking, mm -hmm. right? Are we talking because we felt it was cool that we connected and then potentially something can come out? Or are we talking because I need something from you? And I kind of just didn't feel as comfortable with that dynamic. Um, and I wanted to sort of go back to a sense of me being more centered in who I want to be. Um, and then there was also a constant element of, there was a constant feeling of an imposter syndrome when I was in VC. Hmm. You know, there was constantly this question of, when are they going to realize that I'm not the top guy <laughs> in the room, you know? Because uh, it feels like everyone, when you're in VC, everyone speaks like as if they are the, the closest step to God. Like pretty much, you know, you should start kissing my ring because... Right. I am this right. big shot VC. And the reality is, and this took, it took me a while to figure out that we were both, we were both, we were all potentially feeling a very similar sensation, right? Of like, you know, am I, am I this big shot or do I need to speak this big game? Because I also, as the founder does, need to get more LP money, I need to put myself out there. I need to say that I'm the one who chooses to, and picks the right winners. I got the biggest returns. I got like everything is big and, 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 and like, yeah. huge. And when you don't come across like that and you're actually the guy asking yourself the questions, it's kind of, it gets lonely. I, I started going to events as a speaker um, that be, prior to that, I was like begging for a ticket to go to these events that I couldn't afford going. Right. Yeah. And suddenly I'm being paid expenses and this to go and, and present at these events only to finish presenting and wanting to hide. So I said, nah. Yeah. Not, not, that's not me. You know, it's, it's funny because if you go back to the earlier part of our conversation where it's, you know, performance is potential minus interference, right? Big bucket of interference there from that imposter syndrome. But on the other hand, it also helps you recognize that that's not where you wanted to have the gains in performance. Yeah. Right. Your gains in performance needed to be somewhere else to feel more fulfilled is what it sounds like. And so um, that's really interesting. And the whole the, the concept about the events was is really interesting also because 
to that point, right, you know, you probably hadn't changed all that much as a person from the time in which you were paying to get into the event or trying to versus the time that you were speaking. And so you're sitting there like, I'm the same person I was a month ago. I just have a different title now. Yeah. So does that title now enable me this whole unique life? Um, but yeah, it's it's a really, really interesting concept. I can very clearly understand that one. And quite frankly, I think that even puts things even more into perspective because so what happens when I strip you off the title? Do you still want to talk to me? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Is this conversation still valuable? Yeah, it's a super good point. Right? And so I honestly can say that I started much healthier and beautiful relationships with people that I couldn't really connect when I had the title. Within the environment of, and the ecosystem of the VC world, there were certain people that I just couldn't connect with because we were sort of bumping heads. We just like didn't probably didn't understand like how we could make this transaction work best for both sides. Or there was some sort of tension. The moment I took that tension away by stripping myself of the title and by not needing anything from there anymore with some of those people, I managed to connect beautifully. That's and awesome. So, I love that. So that was, that was really removing the, inter, the interference element and saying, you know what? Right. I don't need anything else from you now. I can just see if I like you as a person. You know? <laughs> and if we do, potentially we could do a gazillion things. But yeah. Better it be organic. Better it be something that we feel clicks. You know, better we feel something that we want to, some, some sort of terrain from which we want to build something. Because ultimately, mm-hmm. life is very short. And I think if we can sort of, in a way, you know, kind of go together for some of the parts of this, this process and learn together and grow together, regardless of whether we're doing business, regardless of whether we're being friends or lovers or whatever that is, you know, in the most potentially wider sense of the use of the word love, right? If we use that love element to connect with people that we actually want the best for, regardless of whatever connection we have, you're going to sell more, you're going to, you know, have better friends, you're just going to, you know, be a better neighbor, whatever you want, right? Like there's no way you're going to return home without honor if you're yeah. literally going out of pursuing love. I, I think that's a, that's an amazing concept. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it gets back to the, you know, you may, you may need some catalyst to begin a relationship, right? And the catalyst may end up being a title or a position yeah. or a need. Um, but then going after the relationship that is the reason for that need is I think, again, to your point, what ends up in business, frankly, really being great, you know, because, uh, you know, do I want to buy something from a sales development rep or a sales rep that just keeps pegging me all the time that never actually asks me any questions about anything? Like, yeah, not really, unless the product is absolute fire, right? Um, but most of the time there's probably a replacement out there. So I'm going to buy from the person that's like, Hey man, how you doing? Especially when uh, there's competition. Yeah, totally. Right? Totally. Like, how many emails a week do we get from email marketers saying, we're going to drive so much business to you. You know, I, <laughs> I can show you this case study. I've been looking at your website. I've been doing this and blah, blah. I literally to half of them, I respond, show me that you've seen my model, show me that you actually understood what we do and show me how it's yeah. different to all the companies that you've worked with and I'll give you a call. Sure. Otherwise, and is it just radio silence? And then radio silence. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, you did so much to get in my inbox and take my time to read this thing and I actually respond to you and then nothing? And then nothing. What did you want me to say? Just like, yes, sounds great, yeah. let's go. Let me click your <laughs> Calendly and let's do it because I'm desperate yeah. for this. No. <laughs> I've worked with agencies for six months and then had to fire them at the end of six months because I went on to some of the ads and realized they still spelled our brand name incorrectly. That is not love, you know? That is great. We got your paycheck. Boom, boom. We don't even look at it. Let's look at numbers. Yeah. And what you just want is someone who really cares. If you, if you find the care, that's, that's where you stay. I love that. I love that. Okay, sorry. I, I interrupted you. So let's... Let's, uh, but I love it. I love our conversations here. So you're leaving the uh, investment VC um, side of the world, and then you're transitioning to your own operating stack, right? Yeah. So I went back. First thing I did was work with immigration. Um, We also did a, so I started a nonprofit in Miami uh, doing mentorship, organizing mentor sessions. 
one of the things I realized, and, and I think it's, it's sort of worth bringing it up because I think it's how we relate to people that we sort of seek help for, from, mm-hmm. um, is I realized I wasn't doing coordinating a lot of mentorship when I was in 500. And a lot of times it's, it's, a, it's, very, it's a very tough thing to match because, uh, first of all, people think of mentors as this figure that you're going to have to sort of marry and it's going to have to mm-hmm. go with you for your whole life. And, you know, it's like, we don't know each other, but let's marry and let's just, yeah. you don't you just don't do that. Um, and the second thing is a lot of times, maybe you have this like huge mentor, like this amazing guy, like we used to fly in this people, like multi-billion dollar companies or whatever, suddenly sitting down with this, this kid who's really, literally, literally just trying to do like his first sales. And so like, there's almost a mismatch if like, you know, yeah. well, if this could have been a great mentor for this other very different type of problem or person or stage, mm-hmm. uh, but like, you know, it's hard to, to make this worthwhile. So one of the things I realized was that if you're looking for mentorship, which you can all, which basically I can even translate it to, you're looking for help, you're looking for support and something. Yeah. One of the biggest things that you should do before you ask him for help is really literally being able to define very clearly what the problem is. And so instead of going from, oh, I have sales problems, and let me get you someone from sales. Saying exactly what's happening and like defining the problem was a big part of being able to find that solution. So what we used to do is um, we would ask a founder to define very clearly a problem, and then we would turn around with that problem and look for someone who would be good for solving that specific question. And that meant your possibility of finding a mentor for that specific problem it's huge because there are so many more people now that you can tap into. Right. You don't need this big figure. People are thinking that, you know, uh, there's this top guy that's going to help me. And a lot of times it's really the guy that's next to you. You just didn't know you could, you know, he's gone through the same. Um, so I did that. And then I also worked with immigration. We uh, I sort of tackled a little bit of this, this element of there's tons of people trying to get into the U.S. to build companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they have huge problems with being able to stay in the U.S. legally. And so... Um, I realized there was a big opportunity to help amazing founders from all over the world to get um, green cards, actually, uh, and, and mm. to reside in the U.S. And so we did that for a while um, with with my lawyer, who was at the time uh, in, also in Miami. Um, and when that sort of faded out, um, I started doing a lot of sports and I got into triathlon and started mm. saw sports sort of taking over my life and like all the conversations that I wanted to have were around sports. I uh, yeah, yeah. jump in this call and the first thing I would talk to you was about my training and my, my <laughs> this and, that. and so when I realized that I, what I mostly wanted to talk to talk about was sports, I said, this is what I need to work with because yeah. I want to talk to more people about this. Sure. And that's how the company started. I, I realized there was a big need for, I mean, at the time, companies that were doing custom, you know, custom clothing uh, would be great with talking with big teams, you know, all these larger orders. But when it came to people who, like myself at the time, was doing 15, 20 hours of training a week, uh, pretty much like training like a pro, but still an mm-hmm. amateur, um, they had no option of going somewhere and buying a custom tri- you know, triathlon suit for the next race right. or a custom jersey. Um, they were literally asked, how many are you? And you're like, well, an army of one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so oh, real deep. <laughs> yeah. So that's where, I, you know, I decided it was time to start. Probably if I would have thought about it, I wouldn't have started there because, you know, then I realized why big brands weren't, weren't doing it. Totally. <laughs> but, uh, but it was a great way to start connecting with people and people exactly like me who were training and were very committed to their training. Uh, but they were just by themselves, you know, there's this like people just giving it all out and then having a life and a work and this and that. Mm. And, um, and so we started giving access to them to, you know, basically being able to get custom gear that speaks to their purpose, their mission, their whys, um, that is custom made for them with unique designs and top quality and that they could still order one piece. This has impacted me a lot because, um, like I said, I used to, used to train quite a bit in for travel. It's been a while since I had kids and started the company. It has really slowed down. It's funny. All these sports that I used to do, like golf, uh, running, swimming, biking, um, you know, they're very long sports or long, like, t- time duration events. And so um, when I first – when we first started the company and we first uh, got pregnant with my first son – I used to ride my bike, I used to commute and it was a 40 mile commute. And like, that was my training, right? So I'd commute in 40 miles and then either take the bus back or if I felt, you know, a little giddy, then I'd ride back. 
but but then even that started getting too long. It's like, yeah, I can't even do that anymore. Um, but to, to the point of the the challenge that you're solving, it's huge, right? When I did that, I would do all these little micro events also, right? These like little team rides. So I had my my bigger team, Kane Performance Training. They got us all kitted out. And then I had a smaller team, like we do a, you know, lymphoma ride for, um, or, or a ride for lymphoma, right? Or a ride for uh, leukemia or something. And I'd have like three or four people with me um, on our little team. And getting custom gear was really hard. Yeah. And so then we have this team for this event and we end up having to wear like whatever our other team kits, our bigger team kits are, or some random thing from Azumi or somebody like that, right? Um, but it was never this collaborative kitted effort that we really wanted. Um, so that's, that's an, that's an awesome way to do it, but it's also really complicated and I'm it assuming is. very costly. So it how is. did you navigate kind of back and forth between those challenges? So the, the, the very sort of the, the business answer to this is, you know, I, I come, I, I sort of come from a software based <clears throat> background mentality. And so when you're looking at a lot of the different models out there, what you're really looking at a lot of times when it comes to e-commerce is you're ready to lose a little bit. So then in the longer term, lifetime value kind of kicks in and, and things sort of start working out, right? So ultimately you're looking for lifetime value that's higher of, you know, um, from that cost, you know, customer acquisition cost. And so in a way, even if, you know, we were profitable from the first sale, maybe the margins are very, you know, the reality is the margins are very small on, yeah. on, on individual production. But my my thought of this my thought of this bigger picture was, you know, bigger brands are catering all the big teams. So what happens is if I go and knock on the door of a big team, they're gonna say, you know what, we're served, we're good, don't worry. Um, and it's hard to get in. And so what we thought of is first of all, we starting with that same mentality that I told you about before, we care. So the, the relationships that we build are very special. And the question was really, how can we get our foot in the door? How can we uh, you know, get people to see how we work, how we feel for them, how you know, we'll treat them and, and how this whole experience will be taken care of if they're not giving us a chance? And, and we knew that the chance wasn't there with the team to begin with, but there was a potential chance with individuals. So we thought, let's connect with people on an individual level. And let's show them a whereabout. Let's show them that we can cater to them, that we're actually caring for them. And they will eventually take us to the teams. And that's what ended up happening. And so um, that's how we work. You know, we, in a way, we take all those individual sales, an opportunity to connect with people who we believe are like-minded, who we believe carry our own values, who we believe we can sort of help amplify the message that, that they're really about. A lot of these people, they're they're competing for causes, or or even you know when it goes very personal, like and and we've have, we've had all sorts of stories, right, of people saying I'm doing this Ironman race because something really happened that was very yeah. big in my life, and they maybe want to put it on their sleeve, or maybe they want to have their kids' names so that when things get rough, they can look at it and know what, why they're there. And who they want to inspire and, and why this whole thing makes sense for them. It's not just about, you know, I, I honestly laugh a little bit when it comes to everyone saying this is the fastest suit in the, <laughs> in, in, in the, in the wind turbine. Like, you know, totally. this, is, this is what's going to give you one second here. Yeah. I think, you know, custom <laughs> is, is a little bit less about that very, very specific edge and more about having the chance to come out to the world with your sort of superhero cape and saying, this is what I'm about. Yeah. And making sure that when you put it on, you feel like nothing can stop you. I because love that. everything that you care about is there with you. Right. And when you, when, I love you when you feel that, believe me, you don't care. You're shaving, you're more than the wind all time off. <laughs> wow, you're going to push. You're going to push like there's no yeah, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Because you know why. You have a why. How can you stop someone with a why? Totally. I love that. You, you said something I think is really important there, which is that, you know, if I were to kind of obfuscate um, some of the words back, the main thing that you did is found a way to isolate very specifically who you wanted to target. And you understood why you wanted to do that. Then I, I think one of the 
one of the bigger questions there, especially for other entrepreneurs um, looking to start their own brands is how did you functionally do that, right? Like, how did you go about finding those people that you wanted to connect with to create that initial relationship? Um, and then how did you communicate with them and, you know, so on and so forth? Yeah. Like, what was that process like? I mean, it, there was an interesting element. First of all, I was one of them, right? So I, I think what really made it at the beginning was that not, none of it was fake. Like, Literally, all of the conversations that I had at the beginning and, and the, the way this was done was pretty much like any hackathon that happens on a weekend. You know, <laughs> I, basically I said, this weekend I need a landing page and I need to start selling. Let's see what happens when I run some ads. I still had no product. I still had no idea. I had gone online and seen, you know, like, is this possible even? Can I order one food of something from somewhere? Is there some crazy person that's ready to produce one piece of something for me? Okay, maybe I found it. Okay, let's order a sample. Okay, let's see how this is going to work. In the meantime, I need to get a landing page up. I need to look like I have a product. I need to see if there's any need for this anywhere. Yeah. And so I built up a website. I you know, put up some little drawings of, of, of some potential <laughs> items of clothing and I started running some ads. Yeah. And within a week I had sales and I was like, I have a problem now. I don't have now, now I need to produce this stuff. And the, yeah. the, the crazy part was that, you know, now people are, are not afraid of like, okay, I'm just going to cancel this and, and no problem. Yeah, you know, like, totally. Which is what something I would tell any, any founder, you know, start with put up a, 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 a you know, a, a storefront and then see if something is there. It doesn't matter if like you don't have a product, just tell the customer, sorry, you know, we run out, whatever it is. But then now, you know, there's intent. There's people actually yeah. wanting this. So up to there, no problem. The problem we've had was that the, the customers that came in, we're doing an Ironman, right? So, okay, let's say I'm going to do, and it was a relay, right? I think I have a picture right here of, uh, of this. this you're going you're gonna to love this. Yeah, I want to see it for sure. So these are our three first customers. No way. Wearing the first suits we've ever done. That's amazing. And well, there's a bunch of different stuff here. Some, some of the other things that happened, right? Like our first cover of USA triathlon. Um, yeah. This is one of our pro athletes winning a race in South Africa. That's so cool. <laughs> um, but you know, suddenly you got three people asking for a suit for their relay Ironman. And timing and timing and everything. They yeah. didn't have, a, they didn't have alternatives. Um, the suits needed to arrive and be perfect. Right, like they gotta, they gotta. Suddenly, you're talking about a race that's gonna last for hours. Yeah, so you want to make sure that everything is perfect. And I kind of took the risk, you know. Um, and I said, you know, we're gonna do it. I, I think more than anything, they took the risk. <laughs> well, honestly, they didn't know. <laughs> um, but we all need this crazy first person. Totally. <laughs> I mean, and maybe they will know. Maybe they won't. But believe me, I did everything in my power to deliver yeah, totally. the best I possibly could. Yeah. Um, those first suits I designed. Like I did, did you really? I did everything. I talked to them. I designed. I deal with the supplier. I did like every part. It's every single part of the process. There was a point in time where people would call this number that we had for the company, and you know mm -hmm. they would have my recorded message of. We're looking for sale. Welcome to Interforce. We're looking for sales. Press one. We're looking for customer <laughs> support. Press two. If this is about you know tracking your order, press three, whatever you would yeah. press. Of course, I'd be the one on the other side saying, hello, Juan speaking, yeah. right? <laughs> so it's all about, in a way, building this castle, hopefully fast enough so that it looks like a castle um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and consciously enough so that it doesn't crumble. Uh, but you learn as you go, right? And, and that's a lot of what this very lean sort of startup model uh, brings up. And I thought it was, it was important to bring it up also when it came to product. So a lot of the stuff that we've done, even if it's a physical product, it, it's always been about keeping that lean mentality and how can we learn as fast as we can? How can we keep on iterating? How can we sort of keep on improving on every single part of the process? Um, hopefully as fast as we possibly can, which is not always easy when you're talking about production that's made to order and that has a lead time of potentially two months from where we're right. starting the process to where you get the, the you know your, your shipment. So 
there's a lot of moving elements. The more you can do to sort of reduce that friction, to reduce that interference, to help with things like sizing, the better you're going to ever be because you're going to be able to really run all the other parts of the business without having to worry so much. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really interesting point. Like when I, there's kind of two ways to, that I focus on it as an entrepreneur, right? One, one way is <clears throat> what are the skills that I don't have that I desperately need in order to reach the next stage of the life cycle of this company, right? And in that sense, it's a lot about team building and things like that, but it also could be kind of learning, right? How do I need to invest my time to develop a skill set that helps us get there? Um, the other thing is looking at problems um, from outside the organization, right? How do I, go ahead and going back to our initial point, how do I make it so easy for customers to say yes, that at least they try it? And then how do I make sure that I satisfy them, right? Um, and I think that that comes through over and over and over again in what you're building, which is, which is again, it's really unique. I, I think a lot of times people want to have a business or they want to sell something. Um, but it's not so much like I really want to create success for my customers. I think a lot of times that's disjointed. Um, and I love the fact that, you know, when you're building this, you're tackling both at the same time. You know, I, I really want to make my customers successful. I really love the space. I really want to also build a business. Um, and those three things coming together, I think are just, it's, it's really beautiful. It's, it's really cool to see in that sense. There's a great lesson that I sort of uh, picked up from this model of, of sort of service leadership, um, which is, it's really about helping them win. That I think that applies to your team, that applies to your customers. I think you need to focus on what can I do to support your own success. Mm -hmm. um, and that means not always being great. Huh? That means also not, not always just managing to, to get there. Um, we've had to say sorry so many times. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the things that we've seen is that a lot of times when you're honest and you can really say, hey, you know what, we screwed up. Um, you get loyalty in return. Yeah, totally. Because most people don't get that from, from a company. No, we, we see that so often. Just like genuine empathy and, and appreciation for, you know, what the customer is going through to, to try you, to try your service is really important. And, and you're right. Normally, it's just like we can't take that stance, right? We just have to bold and narrow. We don't want to lose this customer. We need to stay strong. And it's like saying I'm sorry is, is, a, is an amazing tool. Right. All of a sudden, no matter how much you've screwed up, that person knows that you acknowledge that yeah. and are literally probably willing to give you more chances based on that. Right. It's a, it's a really interesting concept that I don't think is used enough. And if they don't, which is also fair game, at least it was honest. Yep. Yep. That's yeah. right. So one th thinking through again, first thing is like, you know, tackle, you know, you go to you go to set up this thing. You really want to get into it, and you go to isolate on your on your audience that you want to reach out to. You know, what are some of the next steps that you took to continue to you know get your business to the point where that the engine starts going right? What are the what is what may, maybe the first three to five um, projects that you really needed to get off the ground in order to just kind of start that process? Um, I think one of the biggest elements that we had was. It was literally this question of, is this, is this really going to work? Or are we just going to get stuck mm -hmm. with individuals? Because the business model was just never going to grow, right? Like it was never going to happen unless we could see that we could. And, 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 and believe me, this is kind of also defeating the narrative of VC. Because I didn't come into this idea of I'm going to build something that scales. Otherwise, I wouldn't have never started this. Yeah, right. I literally was looking the opposite. I was saying, I want something that doesn't need to scale, that's gonna be very organically connected to who I want to be. And it's gonna get me to having the conversations that I wanna have with the people that I wanna to talk to. And then I realized that everything that came after was kind of the excuse, was the sort of how I'm gonna do this. But, but, yeah. uh, but the reason why was, was very different. It wasn't me saying, I want to build this, you know, venture backed, huge company. It was, yeah. it was like, I want to build space where we can connect with people that I like and be able to support their path, you know, 
How can I help them win? And so a big part of, of being able then to do that in a way that it was going to be sustainable from a, from a business standpoint was, you know, this eventually we need to start selling to teams. We need to capture some of those teams because otherwise yeah. they're just never going to be able to, to grow to, to a place where we can just at least keep on doing this, you know? And the beautiful part was that it actually it started proving right. The, 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 the theory or the strategy of let's go for the individual, they're going to bring in the teams, started proving right. Um, and so I think a big part there was how can we think of growth as something that doesn't necessarily need to happen today, but we have what we're doing today is going to go in the direction that we think growth is going to happen. Mm -hmm. and I think that is one of the questions that you always need to ask yourself. Not everything starts with you selling, you know, huge amounts to huge customers for huge ticket values. Right. A lot of it is understanding first those needs, connecting first to those first customers, being able to understand how the dynamic works, how the sales process works. So a lot of a lot of figuring out at the beginning, so that then you can in a way picture how that's going to scale, and then you know, testing a lot of things and then seeing what works and, and, and having that, that path sort of thought out in the beginning. Uh, and then, you know, also be flexible because things might change. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think then there was an element of also, um, and, and it's something we're still trying to figure out, is how can we keep on improving, you know, our, our lineups, like our, our, our products, our things. Um, I think there's there... Uh, a very sort of thin line of, you know, what's the ideal um, sort of product if you want lifetime um, that you should be keeping in terms of when it, when do we need to redevelop completely a product from the ground up versus mm -hmm. this works, so let's stick to this. And that's, I think, something we're still sort of trying to figure out. Uh, but it was something that at the beginning we needed to understand, you know, like what, what kind of offering do we need to have? Uh, what's what's there that's important? What are what, what what's the ideal customer? Where's the bigger pain point? Is it with a tri suit or is it with a t shirt that they're gonna use for running? Um, I think now we sort of still offer all of them, but I can say we sell a lot more tri suits than than custom t shirts. Yeah. Right? Um, and but I think it's all it's more about understanding the mentality of who you're dealing with and, and what you're trying to achieve when you're. Uh, connecting with the customer, I think it goes back to the same thing. You know, how can we help you bridge that gap to to what you think you need or or you might want? Totally, totally. Yeah, it's uh, product mix. I mean, you know, in our world, we think a lot about sizing. You know, what's your size? Your size runs, um, but it's very similar in a product mix perspective, right? Like, <clears throat> you need to think through all right, I have the singular product and people are buying it, but there's going to be a limiting facet there, right? You, you don't need 500 tri suits, like three, four, five at most, you're yeah. probably pretty satisfied, right? So then what else do you need to buy to enable that? And then what are the surrounding facets around that? And, you know, where can my brand be a part of that journey for that customer? So, you know, really working to understand um, from probably customer interviews, and the data that's coming back through of what are some of the area, other areas that you can invest into to create that full sort of branded athlete. Not that it's about the branding, but it's about like getting them what they need sure. for their life cycle is, is really important. So um, how did you, did you go about that with like customer interviews? Did you use a lot of data on the backside? Like what was the process there? So one of the things that we're launching now, <clears throat> which is, I think sort of our product management sort of approach. I mean, we used to just talk to a lot of customers and I used to have a lot of those conversations. The problem that you have a lot of the times is that it's very hit or miss when it comes to reviews and feedback, because most of the times like you have this sort of trip advisor phenomenon of you comment on something when something like crazy out of the ordinary happens, either it's good or bad. But a lot of the times in the middle, you're like not really replying or saying anything. And I think there we lose a lot of information that's extremely valuable. If we have a customer that, you know, could have potentially have had, for instance, a better size, but we don't hear from him or her, um, it's very tough for us to be able to, to learn from that experience. 
Right. You know, in our case, our sales are final because we're actually producing a, cust- a, a, a very custom made product. <clears throat> but but we've, we've, we've found ways in the past to try to make things better when there was a problem. But unless we know there's a problem, we can't do anything about it. So our biggest issue was potentially we have customers not coming back that we're not hearing from. How can we make this space a little bit more visible? And one of the things that we're just launching now is sort of coming from the software background is this idea of beta testing. And so we're launching a team of people who are actually not just people that we are giving away stuff for uh, or to. Um, it's mostly people who are committed to our brand, who have been with us for years, who care enough to give us honest feedback and still stick with us when things don't go exactly as, as you know as we perfectly would imagine yeah, or hope yeah. for. Uh, but that we are, they're willing to sort of buy into the idea of of getting into the development stages of product. So that before it comes out of the market, we hear from them. We know what's happening. We know if there are any problems with with because sometimes, for instance, a, a you know a product can be great in a size, but then you're building all these different sizes, and you don't know that maybe there's a problem with the two XL, and you don't know it until you get to the customer. But unless right. the customer can again give you back that feedback, you probably will spend you know a bit too much time with that problem without knowing. So our, our main element now is how can we close that feedback loop, make sure that it's as perfect as possible so that no information goes outside of it and we have it as fast as possible as well. So we can iterate fast and then launch products that we believe have already been tested enough and that we believe have gone again through people who actually have paid for so that they're committed to the product and that they want us to succeed as well. I love that. I I think, <clears throat> it's one of the, you know, the, the main concept that I mean, there was a lot there, but just to unpack, I think one of the biggest things that I saw from, you know, what creates or differentiates successful startups with those that are not is pace, right? And so if you think about this conversation, pace comes in often, right? How do I get the feedback necessary as quickly as possible to make a decision? Um, and I think even in the sense, you're like, hey, you know, we're, we're missing this bucket of feedback. That is probably a lot of our core customer because everyone else is out here on like the 10% fringes of either had an amazing experience or I had a poor experience. So how do I, how do I quicken the pace and the completeness of that middle set to get the data back in so I can take it, make a decision. I think it's a, it's a really amazing concept. Um, and I, I hope that more companies understand that like hastening that feedback loop is a really, really powerful conduit to, to getting towards better performance. And there's also an interesting element uh, that, that has to do with, especially when you're an entrepreneur, right? And so you're behind the company in a way. Sometimes it gets very conflicting to receive feedback. You have mm. to be in a very good place because otherwise it's very easy to sort of confuse your own self-worth with what people believe of your product. Totally. So for what happened to us, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not here saying, oh, we're perfect. What happened to us <laughs> was that for a long time, we were scared of asking for feedback. And I'm mm. probably saying we, because I'm sort of in a way making this, this much bigger. But I was scared <laughs> of asking for feedback. <laughs> you know, we I was terrified. Of like people saying, what you guys are doing sucks. Yeah. You know? And then, of course, if someone says, what you're doing is great, you're like, Yes. But at the same time, you know, in the same way that you're sort of taking it almost personal when someone says something is great, you're also scared of asking everyone else how they're doing. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's it's a process and we all need to deal with that. We all need to sort of be able to detach ourselves a little bit from the product and the business Mm -hmm. and being able to say, this is not me. And if we are able to detach from that, then you're potentially in a much better place to improve that product, right? Even if someone comes and says, that's not great. Well, please tell me more. Instead of saying, getting defensive and saying, you know, this is, no, 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 no. You're, what are you t- trying to tell me that what we do is not great? Yeah. You tend to tell me I'm not great? No, no. Instead, if you're probably being able to detach and saying, you know what? I love your feedback. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Because we really want yeah, to. Yeah, it's, it's such an unlock when you can find a way not to blame yourself for yeah. those types of things, right? Yeah. And you can find a way to be curious. And, and I think 
curiosity, you know, and anyone that we, we hire uh, at our companies is one of the, like, it's like we, we hire for grind. Like you got to grind because the whole team should just, we just kind of go get and grind. Right. But I think curiosity is probably like the second most important facet of a successful employee in my purview, right? Not just, I do what I've been told to do, but is there a better way? Like, why do I do it this way? Is there something else that I can bring to the team? Right. You know, why are you asking me this question? Hey, let's talk about it further. Um, that type of mentality is just so powerful when you look at the world with questions as opposed to answers. Um, I, just, I love that concept. There's a, there's a very interesting thing that I've found that comes from a friend that was basically talking about two qualities that seem sometimes very conflicting, but, but you can find them. It's, it's absolute magic, which is the combination of confidence and humility. When you find someone that's confident yet remains very humble, there's so much opportunity for growth. It's insane. Yeah, I love that. Well, Juan, look, it's uh, one, I, I think the time pretty much slipped by as this has almost been an hour, which has been pretty cool. Um, and I, I think that's just a lot of kindred spirit in that sense, right? Um, which I absolutely love talking about. But, but I'd love to wrap up. And I, I think by your, by your kit behind you that we kind of know your favorite activity, but I'd love to understand sort of like, what's your favorite non-work activity? You know, where do you spend your time and, uh, and how do you make sure to balance and harmonize your ability for those out of work activities with the things that you do for work? Um, so it's, it's hard to define one because I think I'm definitely one of the curious types. Um, I would love to live a thousand lives. I, I mm. want to do everything. So this weekend, this past weekend, now I'm training a lot. I have, I'm, I'm going to do um, uh, a lake swim with a group of friends in June. That's 14 kilometer swim. So I'm hoping, you know, that's probably going to be like about five hours of nonstop swimming. Yeah. And so I'm doing a lot of training f- for that right now. But at the same time, I'm writing a novel um, and I, I, I starting to play the piano that I am trying to, you know, spend a bit of time. Um, I think there's a, there's a, there's a whole element of like, what can we do to grow a little bit and how can we feed the curiosity of it doing very different things? And, and sure. I, I love to stay sort of on the edge of my seat to see what else is there, you know, what, what <laughs> else can I do and, and see and experience? And, yeah. and so I think I honestly wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not on the spectrum of the people who think that work is just their, their thing. I think. Uh, we need to sort of keep on developing ourselves to every possible angle that we are curious about. And so I think probably, you know, that element of, of challenging myself to new things is what keeps me alive and, 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 and excited about life. Right. Yeah. So I think it's about that. It's just trying new things and constantly looking for the next new thing. That's fantastic. Uh, it, it's just, very similar I'm like oh what can we try today yeah i'm gonna go buy a guitar and i'm gonna start learning how to play guitar yeah, why not <laughs> it's 100 bucks like let's just go for it and the thing um, is most people would would then sort of look at themselves and say oh i'm not good at playing the guitar yeah what do you mean you're not good like of course you're not jimmy hendrix like this, this yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's unexpected that you could be that that person right but totally. but you would be surprised if you sort of go at it with an open mind and say, mm-hmm. you know, what happens if i just play the guitar a bit you know will that make me happier when I feel that I'm connecting with some part of myself that I'm usually not, right, uh, but right. there's potentially a lot to be rewarded about that. Like there's there's a lot of great things that come out when we're sort of yeah. you know keep on digging on that next new little thing. Totally, it just it, it just opens the mind so much, right? Yeah. To just to force yourself to explore is I just I think very mind opening in a sense. But yeah, well, one look, man, I have had an absolute ball. So thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate that. Thank and, you, uh, you know, I talked a little bit of e-commerce here, but we talked a lot of life. And I, and I think at the end of the day, um, these two worlds have to come together, right? It's, it's the only real way that we can successfully develop solutions to solve our customers' problems. Um, and so in that sense, you know, I think we talked a lot about the psychology of, of how to think about building businesses, how to protect yourself, as well as to enable yourself to continue to grow and explore. So. Uh, really, really appreciate your time here. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, man. <laughs>